That will that never, never work. work. You can't, can't publish that. Seriously? No, that's no, 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 Oh my God, that's bad. You probably should find a hobby. You ever learn to sell? Stop. 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 Don't bother me. I've seen good papers. Do you really want to do And grow my third grade. Give it up. Welcome to Horrible Writing, the rawest, most candid, in-your-face writing show on the interwebs because none of us have time to suck. Let's do this. All right. Welcome to episode 20 of Horrible Writing. This is Paul Sadie, and I am your host. And you all have spoken quite loudly. You kind of dig these interview, this interview series that I'm doing and the folks I'm interviewing, and I'm digging it as well. So this is really cool. The good news for you, I've got another interview for you today. This time, I'm going to talk to a guy who he's on the social medias. You might not see him because he's kind of a quieter person, but you probably have come across his audio dramas uh, because he's got a slew of them. We're going to talk about some of the stuff that he's doing with those. He's a writer. Um, a producer. He's a producer of audio drama. He's a very creative person. And he's got a, one of the things I admire about him is he's got a broad range of stuff that he can do. You'll know about more what I'm talking about here as we get going, but I'm talking about none other than Rick Coast of um, modern audio drama, but that may not ring a bell for you. So let me name some of the stuff that he does. He's done Scotch, The Behemoth, Charlie's Mailbox, Fiona Potts interviews, uh, Inhale, which I really dug. I just finished recently. And then he's got, as is typical with Rick, he's got a lot of stuff coming out. So, Rick, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you very much, Paul. It's, it's great to be here, actually. Well, it's awesome to get this chance to talk to you. You know this because I've told you this in private. Uh, my audience will know this as I make this admission. But there's a lot about you that I try to replicate myself. Oh, well. So to have to have a chance to you know get, a, get this opportunity to talk to you, I'm really excited. Oh, well, thanks, man. All right. And I promise I'll be very kind to you. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to be too kind. That's okay. <laughs> as kind as I can yeah. be, I guess, right? right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so as we do with these, uh, this, it's still in its infancy, obviously, but as I do with these interview portions of horrible writing, I really love bringing on writers who are willing to share more of the, the soft skills of the creative process. Yeah. We could go out there and, you know, we could find a, a gazillion blogs and, and podcasts about the technical side of writing. And I do want to talk to you about that. Mm -hmm. But I also want to have a chat with you about that softer side. So you and I were throwing around some ideas yeah. about what, what we could do. And it wasn't easy. And no. I think... It really, I think that's really indicative of the creative process itself. Yeah, it really was. Because at first, you know, I listened to to the other interviews you had done just so I could get a feel for what you're looking for, for what you called soft skills. Um, so I know my first two ideas really were almost on the technical side. And you called me on that. And as we kept going <laughs> back and forth, I, I remember thinking, well, you know, I would make a, a, a great bartender or therapist. And then it, then it hit me, writing as therapy, because that's my whole life is all about writing as therapy uh, for myself. Um, so, yeah, I threw that out there, and it was it was, the, it was like an aha moment. It's like, oh, we got the subject. Oh, it, it definitely was. As soon as I read it, it, it was. It was that light bulb moment, and I you know, pointed at my phone, and I was like, yes, yeah. that's it right there. Yeah. <laughs> so talk, talk to us about that. What does, what does that even mean for you, that writing is therapy? Uh, well, it, it actually, you know, if I'm being honest, it really goes back to when I was a kid. Um, I, I make you know, no secret that I'm an introvert. I'm you know, a, a very quiet, as you said, on social media. I, I'm not good at self-promotion um, and such. And when I was a child, I was, I was, um, I spent a lot of time reading. Loved comic books. Uh, that's what I did. You know, wake up in the morning, grab my comics, read comics. Uh, as soon as I was able to write, that's. Uh, it was almost like an early form of fan fiction. I would put myself in the character, like say Spider Man. I would write a Spider Man story at you know five, six years old. Of course, it was you know, very simple sentences and everything, but that was my way of 
kind of interacting with a world that I mm-hmm. felt uncomfortable with. Um, so a lot of the, a lot of those early, early stories were just my attempts at, at talking to people, even though it was all in my head, even though it was all imaginary. Um, that was what I identified with and, and Spider-Man in particular, because, uh, the whole, you know, the story with Peter Parker and, uh, being a wallflower and awkward and, and all of that, I really identified with the character. Um, so my early writing really started with trying to understand who I was, even though, of course, I didn't know that at the time, you know, hindsight's twenty right. twenty. looking back, that's exactly what I was doing. I was, I was learning how to talk to people, um, in writing, uh, as I got older, um, uh, as a teenager, getting into music and everything, you know, lyrics were powerful to me. I would I'd probably spend way too much time analyzing lyrics back then. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I always look, you know, I was always looking for the secrets in the lyrics. So then I would start writing my own and poetry, and that was another way to to kind of to kind of work with what I was feeling and all the insecurities and the lack of confidence I had as a as a teenager went into my writing um and that's even today all of the characters every single character i write there's something of me in that character um and that's why i find dialogue for me it's it's easy i don't know how well it comes across to a listener but for me it's almost like i'm sitting down just taking dictation from my psyche and that's where the characters voices come from I like how you phrase that. So when you're writing this stuff, whether we're talking about maybe your earlier works or even a number of the things that you have coming up and you're talking about, um, you know, I I think that that really resonates with me that you at the early stages, your actual childhood, you created through identification. But now part of the process is, you know, seeing the world in, in in your place in it and leaving that little bit of yourself in each one of those characters right does if does it do you feel that it helps you process life things going on in your life whether it's you know Im- immediately intimate to you or even like the bigger grander picture some of your frustrations joys pain etc yeah it it really does um it, i could probably say quite a few examples in just my recent writing, but that's, that's it. Exactly. Uh, if, as, so the best way to put this is, um, if I'm having trouble with something in my life, uh, it could be a relationship problem. It could be, you know, something to do with work, it could, it, pretty much anything. I tend to keep it inside, um, in my normal everyday life. Uh, when I start to write, my that's when it all comes out it comes out in the characters interactions so it's it's almost a way and again this is, almost isn't conscious but it's looking back at what i've done it's so it's almost a way of working through those problems mm-hmm. you know between the characters how the characters talk about it it's really i think it's really myself talking about some of those issues and some of those problems and and a lot of the characters have um are insecure about something, something in the story makes them insecure. And I think that's a way for, for me to work things out, you know, subconsciously, if that makes any sense. It, no, it, I, I can relate to it. And I think a lot, I definitely, I think a lot of writers will be able to as well. One of the things that I thought about while you were answering that though, that is, I feel one of the more curious and I, and I don't mean that to have any kind of negative, negative connotations, but Hearing what you just said about, you know, you know, dealing with these ex- external things or, you know, obviously internal to you, um, life complications and, and processing possibly through the characters is the the demographics of your characters, at least the shows that I've heard so far, mm-hmm. um, which is everything up and up to and including inhale. Um, you have all female protagonists. Do you think. Is that a conscious decision, subconscious decision in in terms of how it relates back to what you just said about, you know, processing life? Yeah, uh, that's that's a good one. Um, initially, my answer would be no, it wasn't conscious. Uh, when I wrote The Behemoth, it was Madison was a character I loved. I'd, I'd had the character of Madison in my head for a long time. I always wanted to do something with the character and The Behemoth was the perfect vehicle for it. Um, 
as I wrote other shows or other stories, it just it seemed to work that way, um, that it was usually a female protagonist. Uh, then I realized that after maybe four or five, it was painfully obvious that everything I was writing was coming from the point of view of a female protagonist. And I went back to a couple stories that I was having that I was struggling with. Uh, Scotch was a good example. Uh, the character of Bobby and Scotch was initially a it was a male protagonist, but I was having trouble with the story, and I couldn't figure out why. And you would think it would be easy um, for for me to to dive into that character, but it it just wasn't working. When I flipped the gender to female, the character just she was alive. It just it was there. Um, so now, now that I'm aware of that, it's almost, that's where I go to first. The character tends to always be a female to start with. I have a couple shows coming up, which, um, which the, the, there's two main characters, one being female, one being a male, but really the focus is usually on the, on the female character. Yeah. I've noticed, I've noticed that. And I, you know, as a, someone who writes myself i i actually have more female protagonists than i do male myself so yeah. it, I, I deliberately asked you that i think out of selfish reasons too because <laughs> you know i wanted to kind of yeah. it's almost like a sanity check right you know i think i have a clue why i do it why do you and think and i know you, you do, do it. it as well <laughs> right exactly so, so why do you well, think you do i think what i i think the reason i do it is because i can feel and it, this sounds so you know, it's probably a generational thing because of being a Gen Xer. So I'm not exactly a young puppy, but you know, for me, it's the way I was, I feel the way I was raised to be a man. Right. And you, and you stay distant from anything that wasn't anger. And I have found that when my most tender, most vulnerable stories have always had female protagonists. And I don't, I, I didn't even realize it until I was actually preparing for this interview. And I was thinking about you and what you do. And I thought, well, damn, that's kind of, Something I do with my female leads is when I really, without a conscious decision, when I really want to touch on, you know, those more vulnerable emotions and experiences, yeah. it kind of, it, it's really weird for me. Yeah. I, you know, and I, as, you, as you're saying that, I, I think too, a lot of times in my life when I've had trouble or had troubles, um, I would talk to a female friend about it and work that out. I think going back to the characters and and writing being this therapy that's that's probably a it probably need to be on a, a therapist couch for this one it's probably <laughs> um my way of engaging with a a female listener to to hear and work through whatever it is i may be going through even if i'm not aware i'm going through that it's probably where the uh with the female character protagonists uh, are usually there for me. If yeah, and, and and it makes sense if you're, you know, if your life experience. I mean, we were all shaped by what the the path in life we've walked, and right. You know, I've even professionally, all of my, with the exception of two guys, you know, being prior military, I've had more supervisors than I could ever count because we move so often. <laughs> yeah. But uh, out of those hundreds, there's only two guys that come right to mind as. People that I would consider, you know, somewhat as mentors, as as good leaders, people who have shaped who I am now as an as an adult. But the rest are all female. And my my career mentor, the person who really changed my life on a professional level, was a female who I still to this day check in with, you know, once every six, seven months, yeah. stuff like that. And I think I think that comes, you know, you know, subtly, obviously from my background, what I identify, what I don't identify with and try to get around that you know, that toxic mindset that guys can't talk about pain and, and despair and being sad, you know? Right. Exactly. Even at my age, I think I use them to work through it. So it was, yep. it's always interesting to me when I hear your characters, because again, your shows in a good way are all over the place. Um, you don't stick to one genre and have you, have you, what parts, hmm. let me ask it this way. What parts of Rick have we seen through the behemoth all the way to in hell because I don't want to ask you to do anything spoilerish for any of the up so, upcoming stuff. But your characters, I mean, even though they're all female, they're really they span the spectrum. Yeah. Um. As far as what parts of me do you see in them? There's 
I think that's probably why a lot of the shows are so different. If I did this, if I did Madison over and over again, I'd get bored with it. The listener would get bored with it. The reader would get bored with it. Um, but what I tend to do is I'll start off with a situation that interests me. So I, first and foremost, I write for myself and, and not so much an audience. Uh, and hopefully it works. And so far it has. So I've, I've been lucky in that respect. But I'll, I'll go with the, a story that, that interests me. And then I'll add my female protagonist to it. And as she works through that, it's how she's dealing with that is probably a good indication of how I would deal with it, if that makes mm -hmm. any sense. So that's probably to a roundabout way of answering your question. It's probably how you would see bits and pieces of me in each story is, is through the whatever situation the uh, the female protagonist in like Madison or or even Bobby or even Fiona Potts. With this, with this, you know, serving as like therapy for you. Right. Um, with do you have you ever sat down and tried to figure out what drives it? And I, this is sort of a loaded question because you and I, you know, like you said, <laughs> like we shared at the beginning, yeah. we threw ideas back and forth as we were trying to um. Uh, determine what soft skill, what part of being a writer, the soft skill part of being a writer, could we share with other creatives when they listen? Right. And one of the things that you mentioned was, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, so please correct this as you need to. Sure. But um, the the drive, the desire to be perfect, to deliver something perfect. So does th this thera therapeutic aspect of writing, is it driven is is the need to be perfect a catalyst? Is it more complex than that? Is that not even a fair question? <laughs> no, it's it's a fair question. Um, the 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 desire to be perfect usually hits me when I'm writing later on in in the process. It's not how I. Well, actually, I'll step back a bit. the The blank page. Are we allowed to swear on this? Yes, we okay. are. <laughs> <laughs> well, the blank page scares the shit out of me. Whenever there's yeah. a when, whenever I'm starting a new project, it's that that first page, that first line that that I freeze up on. As soon as I get that first sentence out, it's it's almost like I'm carried away. I'm I'm gone. Um, mm -hmm. I'm no longer there. It's the character, which that's that's wonderful when that happens. So, in a little bit, is that desire for the perfect beginning. And, and I hate to go back and edit and tweak things. Of course, you have to. But uh, I don't like to tweak my beginning. And I don't know why that is. It's, that's just a thing with me. So I'm always, I always stare at that blank page and I want to get it. I want to start off perfect. But later on, as I've gone on, say, I've, say I'm writing an episodic story. I could be six, seven episodes in. It seems to be around that point in the story that... I can tell if it's working, it, even if it's not working a little bit, if there's something I feel uncomfortable about, my first thought is, well, I'll fix it in editing on the second draft, but nine times out of 10, I'll trash it. I'll start over. And, and that's a, as to exactly why that is, I'm not sure I could answer that. That might require a whole nother episode, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, it's, if. That's when I get to that point, if I'm feeling that something doesn't work, and that's happened I, two different times in the past year where I've gone into seven episodes of a, of a project, I've started over instead of going back and, and fixing when I, it, going back to look to see where things might have gone off track. Instead of doing that, I'll just start the whole thing over. And that's, and that's a little bit of wanting it to be perfect, but uh, this, there's got to be something else there, and I haven't figured that out. But you know, that that's a good one. I have to think about that. That way, and that's interesting for me because I'm uh, pretty much the complete inverse of that. I, you know, when when I look at that blank page, it's already been percolating in my head when I was taking a shower or just when I was waking up pouring the coffee, and that first line is always the first thing there. Yeah. And then I'm after I get that done, I'm in the character's head. Um, but. Once I start going, 
it's like a su- sunk cost uh, fallacy for me. I am not going to trash that. I'm going to make that damn thing work if it's the yeah. death of me. So it's interesting. I, you were you were saying that that you know you could trash something, and I'm sitting here squirming <laughs> as I'm talking to you because I'm like, oh my god, I can't. Im-. That would yeah. hurt physically. Hurt. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. It's like the you know Stephen King always says, you know, go back and you know kill your darlings. You know, you've, you've probably heard that. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I I have such a hard time going back and editing something. And taking out pieces that don't work, and I, I, I guess I just I blow the whole thing up. Well, and, and you know, hey, we're all. That's a beautiful thing about uh, being a creative is we all go about our own way doing it. Yeah, I, you know, one of the things I always tell other people, especially when they're looking for advice, whether it's a Facebook group or um, a, a comment in a writers group type of thing, is. One of the things I hate to see, and I think you've seen it, Rick, in one of the groups that we belong to. But I'll I hang out on writers groups as well in social media forums. And I one of the I can always tell when I'm not so patient with a post because it'll start out with something like I was told I should dot dot dot. (laughs) And (laughs) I try to preach the gospel of don't let other people should on your Mm -hmm. creative process because we all do it so differently. Yeah, that's so true. And and as much as, you know, I, I hate admitting that I just toss everything out and start over. It's always the second time or the, the second attempt. It's so much better. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's so far it, that's happened with, um, with Izzy. I was, I think I might've actually finished that and it just didn't work. And that was, oh my God. And so, and so I started the whole thing from scratch. And the problem with that, that one was, and that was another thing that was probably the only story that I've ever written or, or show that I've ever produced that I get going back to perfection that I wanted that to be perfect not because I wanted it to be it was initially behemoth 2 it was supposed to be part 2 of the behemoth and the behemoth had done so well and I loved that show so much I wanted to tell some more of the story yeah so I didn't want to screw it up and I didn't want it to be one of those um, sequels that just don't add up to the original so I didn't want to fall into that trap and I think I, so I thought, well, I'm going to, I'm, well, I want, for one, I changed the protagonist. It wasn't Madison. I used another character named Izzy. So she was completely different. Another complete take on the situation of having a, a world where the behemoth exists. Um, so I wrote the story completely different. Instead of being a, nar- a narrative, I did it more as an audio drama with a full cast um, and it, it was forced. It just, it didn't work as I, as I was going through it. Um, and I think, like I said, I think I finished it, realized that it's, it's just not, it, it sounds as if I'm trying to do a sequel that's different. So I uh, changed it to Izzy and turned it into more of an epilogue to the original story. And I, I, then I worked in some narration because I work better with, with a, the narrative style anyway. So yeah. that was uh, one example where going back, wanting it to be perfect, um, actually worked out. Not to say that the show's perfect, but I was very happy with it when it was done. <laughs> you know, I don't think uh, any of us who take this seriously could ever. I, I, I would, I would be very hesitant, hesitant to say that. Um, any of us who do this stuff seriously would ever say that the stuff we put out there is perfect. Oh God, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. I, all I do when, when I'm done, if I'm happy with it, if it touches me somehow, um, if I, and some of the stories at when, that when I'm at the last page and I write that last sentence, if I feel a sense of loss and, and a tear in my eye, then I know I, I did it right. At least for me. Um, and no, if it works, I love that. You you actually just gave me chills with that. And I'm not bullshitting you. You actually gave me chills with that because that's it. That's the feeling that I get when I'm happy with a story. Yeah. It, is that is that sense of, you know, longing because you've just lost something. Yeah. Um, and that's when I when I have that feeling, I know it's OK. And I didn't have that for the first draft of um, uh, the first attempt to write a, a sort of sequel to behemoth and the same thing with the fiona potts interview it was completely different it was a completely different show and that didn't work and i went back and i fell in love with that character as well uh, the show i'm writing 
well, actually not writing. I'm in the middle of production on a show right now. And that show is another one that I completely changed. So I go through that a lot. Um, luckily, I have the time to. It's not that I have all the time in the world, but I get up. I, you do the same thing. Uh, I get up extremely yeah. early in the morning. Um, that's where I get all my writing done. Um, that's, so, it's good. To, it's good to hear that I've got another member of the. Uh, I call it the four fifty eight club. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's a perfect way to put it. So yeah, I don't want to be alone I, in the four fifty eight right. club anymore. Yeah, yeah I feel I'm like- trying to uh, convince Raul Vega of Rose Drive to join me, but I, yeah, you know, he, we're at different p- points in our life, and I don't think I'm ever going to get him to be a member of it. <laughs> yeah, and I couldn't. I've tried to write in the evening. It just doesn't work for me. I usually, no. I usually end up trashing whatever it is because it, it's. I, I need that that blank mindset in the morning because yep. I, I, I'll usually go to bed thinking about the story. Dude, um, we are like brothers from another mother. That's scary. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's and so I'll think about it in the morning. I'm, I'm ready to go. Um, so I fire up the laptop, you know, I'll write for a good couple hours. Um, it, it does suck after you know a couple of weeks of doing that when I have to, when I trash it and have to start over, but at least, at least I have enough going on that, I I haven't lost a lot of time. If that you know what I mean? Oh yeah, no, it, it totally does. And, you know, um, like like Sarah shared in uh, her interview episode sixteen. For those of you who haven't heard it yet, go back to that episode, check it out. You know, she spent eight years on one story. Yeah, that one, that's right. You know, never yes. see the light of day. So, and I think it's part of the way that you process it, which is kind of surprising for me because again. From a business standpoint, approaching the stuff like a business, I've tried to mimic a lot of what you do, which is, you know, why I've got the four show, well, three shows out there, a fourth one coming. Um, but, you know, working books on the side as well. Um, I always have a story living in my head for so long that by the time it actually, you know, by the time yeah. it gets up to the top of the to do list, right. I, I just, it's a sprint for me. Like, for example, I'm, you know, even though we haven't released se- season two of Subject Found, I'm already, ha- like today, this morning, I finished the fifth episode of the third season. So I'm halfway through writing the third season. Oh, that's which, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody's going to even hear until 2019. But it's because they, you know, they live there for so long. So for me, it's, it's weird to hear that you, someone as prolific as you, will go through and sometimes do an entire series and then yeah. start from scratch again because I don't know how you put out so much then. That's even more impressive to me. Oh, well, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I've thought at times to do a show that's that's in seasons. I just can't do it. Um, I love that you can because and they're good. I would get myself, I could not... <sighs> I'd get bored with with the same yeah. story. At least you keep the seasons or the story gripping enough to to keep people interested. And I'm assuming yourself too. Um, yeah, I, exactly. <laughs> I couldn't. I that's why I have so many different shows and why I do miniseries. I just there's too many thoughts, too many ideas, too many things I want to get out. Um, I'll end yep. up getting bored with it, and I'll end up bo- boring whoever it is reading or listening to what I'm working on. Well, and that's what, you know, um, because now I can actually talk about it because the season started, but that's why we only ended up doing four seasons of Atheist Apocalypse. I wrote that fourth season, finished it yeah. over, you know, over about a year and a half ago. And, you know, in, in that time, never once in the in the subsequent 18 months did I go, gee, that was a lot of fun. I want to go write a fifth season. <laughs> Not that I could, because <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. as, as people will find out w- when they get to the series finale this spring, yeah. uh, there's no way I can go back and revisit it. But, you know, like you, I just, you know, that's why I think I have them structured like that with Atheist Apocalypse being the really only true serialized show because Subject Found, it's a new monster that's every right. season. That's what that's so that, cool you know, it kind of keeps yeah. me, yeah, it keeps me fr- like you because I would get bored out of my mind. Diary of a Madman? I only wrote the first season. Uh, a, a, a guy, um, oh, White right. Noise. I yeah, that. right. He, he wrote season two. There's a guy named Matt wrote season three. Sarah Golding is writing a season of it. So it's, uh, it, yeah, it's you know, like you, I couldn't do it, man. I could yeah. not. I'd get so bored. <laughs> that's too funny. You know, it's funny. I love that about Subject Found too, with it with the new monster and such. I don't know if, if I, you know, I don't know your age and such. I'm not asking, but there was a show back um, when I was younger called Cold Chap Night Stalker. And every every episode was a new monster, a new a new thing to go after, and I loved that show. 
it let yeah. it lets you play around and explore. You know what right. I mean? So yeah, yeah, I'm with you. I and and that's well. Before we get to your shows, okay? Because I almost just asked you about your the shows you've got going on. You have to. You've you've been wonderful. You've been great. You've shared a lot. But now it's time for you to share your horrible writing experience. So we, <laughs> we right. have all, the, the spirit of this question is, yeah. you know, share something that you're comfortable sharing. But what I try to do is I'll never know who, ev- everyone who trips across a show. And I see that a lot where we are, our, we creatives, writers are our own worst critics. And a lot of us fade away into life because we give up chasing this thing because there are serious significant obstacles that present themselves that can throw us off track in our writing journey. So yeah. through through sharing through other creatives sharing their horrible writing experience, what I'm hoping to do, Rick, is kind of help other people see, you know, I mean, you, you've got a plethora of wonderful content out there, but in a couple of seconds, people are going to hear that it isn't all, you know, sunshine and, and rainbows for you. Right. And so, you know, I want to kind of encourage them through our own stories. So Rick, if you don't mind, What's your horrible writing experience? Okay, um, I've got a couple, but, but the one one I'll I'll tackle right now is in early on um, when I was trying to find a publisher, I was failing. I was I wasn't able to find a publisher for a couple a couple manuscripts that I had. Uh, I was proud of them, just was ha- not having any luck with it. Couldn't find an agent, so I decided I would self publish them. And this was going back 2002, 2003, early on when um, just as the self-publishing um, companies became online and, and made it easier to do so. So there were, so I self-published both books. Um, so they're out there. I'm not going to tell you what pen name they're under, <laughs> <laughs> but I recently went back and flipped through one of those and it's horrible. It's, <laughs> I, I can't, I, that, that's why I won't tell you what this, what the books are and I won't I tell you what the you. name is on it, but there are two books out there on Amazon, but, and I can't get them down. I don't know how to, how to get those books gone, <laughs> gone, oh, no. gone from the history books, but they're both there. They both are still available to purchase and, and yeah, they, I can't stomach the fact that they're out there and somehow some way somebody will attach my name to those two books and they'll <laughs> be like yeah, yeah this this guy doesn't know what he's doing <laughs> and so, so that's that's what those that's probably the biggest one and it's it's my uh, deepest darkest secret that there's two books out there under a different name that I don't want anybody to know about um, the other thing is more recent and and I, I I'll try not to take up too much time on this and it's not it's not so much a horrible writing it's something I wish I had done differently, and that's recent. Is with the the show Scotch. Um, I and I'm not saying that's a a piece of horrible writing, but I wish I had made the character of Bobby stronger. Mm-hmm. Um, I love the show. I love the character, but when I've re listened to it or revisited the script, she's she's too passive in what's happening to her and she's not as strong as in my head she was very strong i think she comes across as a little too passive and it's one show that i yeah you can't go back and completely change it at this point but it's it's the one show i feel the worst about in the portrayal of my female protagonist um because in my head she was strong, but I don't think it comes across that way in the story. And that's interesting because that's actually your fir- the you know your first creation that I came across. I did not uh, know Behemoth when I found Scotch. I think I found Scotch because of the uh, artwork that you selected. I was like, okay, uh, this is cool. I think I knew your name yeah. a little bit out in the periphery, so I checked it out because of the artwork. And I actually I really liked that story. But I'm now glad. you're gonna make me go back and listen to it again. Well, yeah, it's just <laughs> again, it's one of those things. Um, I wish she was stronger. I think I I, I pushed her through the plot. Um, it, that's a more of a technical side, so we won't get into plot driven stories as opposed to not. But I think. Um, I forced a plot on her and she didn't deal with it as, as strongly as I would have liked. And I think that comes across. And that's, you know, and that's really interesting, but I do, I do appreciate it. And I think, I know, how do you feel about your, um, 
female protagonist iteration since her then? Because my, my Paul's personal opinion is uh, you've had strong, I mean, I feel you've had strong female protagonists all the way th- through, but now understanding where you're at with Scotch, how do you feel about the the ones that you've created, you know, since, since that story? Um, it, that's, it's worked out. Not that I'm trying to make them stronger. That's just the way I think they, they come through. Um, but now I, I'm not as focused on a plot driven story. And I think that's what did it. I think, okay. I think forcing her into a situation that, that I wanted her to be in, um, pushed her into, to being, uh, more passive. I don't know if I know I'm talking about her as if she's a real person, but to me, she was when I was writing it, um, man, they are all real people. Yeah, <laughs> they, they really are. Um, so, so now I, I tend to let the story flow more. I, I'll have a, an idea of where I want the story to go. I know how I want it to start. I kind of know some of the situations that I, that I foresee happening as if I'm like, as if I'm, as if I'm an all knowing being looking down at the whole thing, I kind of right. know the direction the story will go and how it will probably end. Sometimes the ending surprises even me, but n- now I tend to write that way and I let the the character drive the story. See, so listeners, there you go. He, he didn't stop after that. He didn't uh, have any regrets and, you know, pull back from audio drama. He kept plugging. He learned. He lived. He brushed himself off, got up, and kept going. <laughs> yeah, right. I th- but I think that's so critical for us to do because we are going to put stuff out there and we're going to hear about it. Um, good, bad, and ugly, we're right. going to hear about it. So it's something I think that we develop over time. And if we can save each episode, if I can save one creative from not giving up, or it'll be, you know, I can say that uh, this show has, you know, reached its objective. It really has. And I, and I mean that yeah, seriously. That's because great. it's, you know, not necessarily... Um, something that's easy to do, you know, asking you guys to come on and then share, you know, things that you feel you could have done better or things you really, you know, just screwed up and, um, and then ask, but I think it's very important for, for observers, for aspiring writers, aspiring auto audio dramatists to, to hear these kind of things. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So let's talk about your shows, uh, for a couple minutes. So, I mean, you've got a slew of them, so I'll let you, you highlight what you want, but I'd, I'd really appreciate it if you kind of give folks an idea of what you've done, but also what you've got coming up. Because like I said, listeners, Rick has got, um, a slew of, of genres and, um, generational genres, if you will, he, you know, all the way from almost a very friendly, kid centric story to more mature content. So Rick, yeah. hi- what are your highlights and what do you have coming up for us? Um, highlights. Okay. So there are eight shows out now and I might have that number wrong, but there's, <laughs> there's eight shows out. Um, no, but- you're right. I just counted. <laughs> okay. So, so Briar Lane is the one that's the most, um, that's, that was my attempt to recreate. And I, I said this on to, uh, to Sarah Golding in an interview with her. It was my attempt to recreate the, the family atmosphere of sitting around the TV to watch Wonderful World of Disney on a Sunday night. That's mm-hmm. what I was going for with Briar Lane. Um, I love that show. I'm very, I'm immensely proud of that one. So I, I, yeah. I usually point people to that show um, as a starting point for younger listeners, especially for younger audiences. Um, but for what I'm working on now, I have three shows that are in various stages of production. There's, is there anybody out there? which will be coming out um, shooting for December 12th. Uh, I haven't committed to that date, but that's that's where I am looking at, or what I'm looking at. That one brings back Mackenzie Bryant, who starred as the voice of Bobby and the, be- um, not the behemoth, in Scotch. So she is the, the lead in that as across from Mark Kutu, who um, does a wonderful job. So it's really a two-person show. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's coming out in December. After that, I'm in the middle of production of a show called Carbon Dreams. Uh, That's kind of a science fiction show. It's a full cast audio drama as well. Uh, Okay. No narration. It's uh, that's that's a little different for me. Uh, The same with Is there anybody out there? There's no narration in that as well. Um, So that one's in the middle of production. Look for that in the beginning of 2018. As soon as Is there anybody out there wraps up. And right now I am casting for a show called Pixie, which is a show about the devil's daughter. 
And that one is also geared towards a younger audience. Have a wonderful cast lined up for that. I heard, uh, you know, John Grill's show, um, Creepy. Yes. I, I heard it on Nicole Goodnight on one of his episodes recently. Loved what she did, and she's going to be playing the part of Pixie. Oh, very cool. Yeah, so so I'm excited about that. And I'm scripting another show right now that's called, and this is a kind of an exclusive. So the working oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so the working title is uh, Shelter from the Storms. Not Shelter from the Storm to be confused with the Bob Dylan song, but <laughs> Shelter from the Storms. They had to kind of get around the copyright piece there. <laughs> right. But, but uh, so yeah, so I'm scripting that now. I just started. Uh, writing that this week, I have a couple episodes under my belt. I managed to get past that blank page syndrome and started that uh, yesterday. Nice. You, uh, your uh, output is just ridiculous. It really is. <laughs> well, it keeps me busy, but I, I, like I said at the beginning, it's it's my way of working through life. <laughs> <laughs> right. So are you ever going to go into, well, that you can publicly admit to, are you going to go back into longer form stuff at any point? Uh, as you mean, like in novels? Yeah, like novels. Uh, yeah, I've actually tried. Um, okay. With with inhale, I thought I would take that because I that's a story I, I think I can do a lot with. Um, I can move that in a lot of different directions. So I thought with um with that that I would start it as a novel. I would write a a, a novel treatment of the story, but I. Again, this is me. I get bored with things, <laughs> so so I got a, I got six chapters into that, and it's kind of collecting dust at the moment oh, as, okay. as I work on the uh, on the scripts, which um, that seems to be where my sweet spot is is the uh, the short you know episodic scripts, which are kind of like oh, and I've rebranded in a sense too. I don't know if you know about this, but I've uh, I launched a new site called audiocomicbooks.com. Because okay. I, that's how I view these stories are, are more like comic books going back to my love of comics. Um, so I view these stories, all of the shows as basically being short comic runs. Um, and so now if you go to audiocomicbooks.com, you'll see all of the shows sort of rebranded as as comic book art uh, with comic book covers. And each show is, is in, like a separate issue of the comic. Um, so I'm doing that now just to, uh, just to keep it interesting. It's really, again, more for me. So I don't get bored with things. I'm always trying something new, uh, just to, just to not get stagnant. This is really, I'll make sure I link that as well. This is gorgeous, uh, website. I was looking at it while you were talking about it. I had not, I had no idea you had done that. That's really clever. Again, yeah, something else for me to steal from you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so maybe we can, you know, get that name out there. Audio Comics. That'll be the new, the new brand. <laughs> there we go. And yeah. I love. And, and you always do. You use the same artist for all your stuff because you've got some gorgeous uh, artwork. No, I don't. Um, but yeah, I've been really lucky with the with the artists. They're um, the one who did uh, Jamia Knopf is uh, she's from Germany. She did the Briar Lane. She did Fiona Potts, the 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 face of Fiona Potts. Okay. Uh, she's also done Charlie's Mailbox. Um, she's wonderful, um, but she's also pursuing her own career as as a with her own projects. So I've had to look for other artists because of that, and um, I think I think you'll be happy with with some of the other uh, artwork that's coming up for some of the the people I've reached out to um, Pixie, which you don't, you won't see on the audio comic books.com site, but the artwork for Pixie is on modern audio fiction.com. And that one is, is I found a great artist for that. She did a, an amazing job. Yeah. I'm looking at that actually right now. I've had it up for a few minutes here and it's, yeah, it's gorgeous. I, I, but again, I like your, you're very, you're in, you're in touch. I feel with what works with this stuff, you know, to really take it to that next level. This is a, some really classy stuff. As were your answers to this, I really appreciate you coming on and, um, you know, opening up about this stuff that not everyone would do. So I really oh, appreciate your time. I know you're not necessarily deep down into the social media stuff, but if someone yeah. were to wanting to reach out to you and say hi, how could they find you? Oh, um, well, I, I am on Twitter at Rick Coast, and I, I do try to, to stay on there. That's, that's, um, 
you'll usually see me if it's not every day it's every other day i'll I'll put something out there um but i also have on facebook rick coast productions there's a page for that uh, you can reach me on facebook um, email uh, through the website i love corresponding with people through email so you can always get me uh, via email that's that, that's probably the best way so i do have an instagram account as well that i link to on on the site but i'm not as active on instagram because i'm i'm not a great picture taker <laughs> so, so, so i feel ya. yeah yeah <laughs> so when you see anything from me on instagram it's going to be cover art or something like that <laughs> I I totally feel you on that one, a hundred percent. Well, uh, Rick, I do want to thank you for your time and for sharing um a lot of that that personal insight into what makes you as a, a creative, and you know for sharing your horrible writing experiences, <laughs> listeners. I'm telling you right now, if you've got a young one in the house, or if you're all you know twenty somethings, thirty somethings, and beyond, Rick's definitely going to have something that will um pique your interest, that will interest you, um and you know just obviously check out the uh, show notes for which episode because some stuff is not necessarily for younger audiences but Rick you offer everything to the world I want to thank you for uh, the stuff that you create and um, what you contribute back to the, the you know just the community because it, it just makes it your stories make it richer and I really appreciate you coming on no, thanks Paul yeah, this has been a lot of fun it really has I, I appreciate this all right everybody hey thank you for your download and your listen I hope you enjoyed that interview with Rick. Uh, Rick's an absolutely wonderful, caring, giving person. And obviously a talented creator. A couple of the reasons why I wanted to have him on so early in this exploration of interviews with other creatives, other writers. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you took a lot out of it. And and like I said, honestly... Uh, anything, anyone that you have in the house, any range, age range, any interest in fiction, Rick probably has something for you, for that person that you love. And if he doesn't yet, he's going to. As you heard, uh, he's just got so much coming down the pipe. And it's great. It really, it's wonderful to watch him create what he creates. So... I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you took something out of it. And and like I said, you know, hey, we all do this differently. And now Rick being the third interviewee in this series, you can kind of see that hold itself up, that we all do things so much so differently. And yet we keep plugging along. And that's really the lesson I want to I want to take away. I want you to take away as we wrap up this episode, episode 20. It's going to be the last episode of 2017. The show will come back on January 7th of 2018. Uh, But I need a couple weeks away to just kind of enjoy the people in my life that I have. Return that balance back to my world. And I hope you do as well. Regardless of your perspective on the next couple weeks as we head into through the traditional holiday season and into the new year. Uh, I know we all come from different places in the world, different thoughts, different beliefs, and some of us have been through uh, things that don't necessarily make this season very easy to get through. Uh, My thoughts are with all of you, each and every one of you, and um, if this is a tough time, please know that there are people out in the world who are sympathetic and are thinking of you and I just wish my uh, most well wishes to you that you find peace in this season that you reach out if you need something if you need someone to talk to and uh, I'll be around shoot me an email (laughs) I swear I'm not that bad of a guy I don't think so anyways but who does right anyways I, I truly hope I mean that and I hope that for all of you Thank you for making this first calendar year of horrible writing a fun adventure. Uh, I'm enjoying it, and I'm enjoying the feedback that I am hearing from other writers. And I hope that this next uh, year, coming up starting in 2018, I hope it's a year of revelations for all of us. I do. 
my goal for 2018 is to get one of these books published. I want to be a little more adventurous. I think I can get three published. Let's see. Hold me to that, okay? <laughs> but like I said, when this started, I'm my plan to do this was to take you from a know-nothing writer to someone who is at least published, <laughs> if nothing else. Right now, that will be my terms of success. Did I or did I not get published in 2018? <laughs> we'll go from there. All right, so hey, uh, I wish you all well. I'm going to go take a couple weeks off uh, from podcasting, not from anything else because I don't get vacation time in my job, and I will see you in 2018. Until that time, keep being epic. This has been Horrible Writing, and hopefully after this episode, you suck less than you did at the beginning. I am Paul Sadin, your host, Extraordinaire. You can find me over on the Twitterverse, at Writing Horrible, and over at paulsadin.com forward slash horrible dash writing. Until next time, suck less. Suck less.